Hello and welcome to another lecture in Western Civilization. And I've been examining the crisis of European politics in the interwar period, examining the emergence of communism in the Soviet Union, the emergence of fascism in Italy, and the crisis of democracy in the Western states, France, England, and the new emerging democracy of Germany. Mussolini and his black shirts were the first fascist party to seize power in Europe. Adolf Hitler's National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, would become the most powerful new movement of the new right in the interwar years. Yet in 1928, less than five years before Hitler's assumption of power, Hitler's National Socialist German Workers' Party, or NSDAP, had less than 3% of the national vote. It was wandering on almost all observers called the lunatic fringes of German politics. One member of what would be the equivalent of the German FBI observed in 1928, following the 1928 elections, that this was a dynamic party. It had all sorts of ideas about propaganda. It had fanatical leadership. But, as he put it, this was a party that was going nowhere. It had little ability to influence a significant number of Germans, and its political future was cloudy. Indeed, not very optimistic at all. Within a matter of two years, the National Socialist German Workers' Party would emerge as the second largest party in Germany. By 1932, it would become the largest. And in January of 1933, Adolf Hitler would be appointed chancellor. How did this happen? How did this remarkable, dramatic turn of political fortunes, so laden with consequences for Germany, for Europe, and for the world come about. How did the NSDAP turn its fortunes from being a minor curiosity on the radical fringes of German politics to being the largest political party in German Central Europe? That is the theme of this lecture. The German Workers' Party was founded in Munich in 1919. Adolf Hitler, a young German soldier who had been wounded at the front, recuperating in Munich, was sent out to observe the German Workers' Party's meetings. If the party declared that it was going to have an open meeting, the military authorities, still operating, under the conditions of martial law, sent out an observer to write up a report on the party. Hitler went to the meeting, listened to the speeches, and joined the party shortly thereafter. Within an almost no time at all, Adolf Hitler assumed the leadership of the German Workers' Party. Hitler himself was not a German citizen. He was an Austrian citizen who had served in the German army. He had absolutely no previous political experience. But in 1919 and into early 1920, Adolf Hitler discovered that he had a remarkable talent for public speaking, an almost innate sense of propaganda and its possibilities. He quickly emerged 
as the leader of this workers' party. He changed its name and rewrote its program. He transformed what had been largely a debating society in Munich into an organized political party. One of his first actions upon achieving real control of the party in 1920 was to change its name from the German Workers' Party to the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Its abbreviation, or a short of National Socialist, it was a term the Nazis themselves never used, but the name Nazi was extremely important because it suggested that this was going to be a different sort of political organization. It was an enigma in German political life, aiming to recruit support from every class, from every region in Germany, drawing on the vocabulary and ideas from both socialism and the right. Indeed, the very name of the party, National Socialist German Workers' Party, indicated this attempt to cross the great divides of German political life. National, indicating a right-wing movement. Socialist, left. German, again, on the right. Workers, on the left. A party that didn't fit the usual cleavage lines of German politics. In 1920, he would draft the so-called 25 points, which would become the official program of the NSDAP. And that program would not change throughout the 1920s and into the early 1930s. The party was rabidly anti-Marxist, seeing in Marxism one of the great banes of modern industrial society. But at the same time, it was also anti-capitalist, anti-big business. So it combined two of these features of the modern ideological debate. It called for the establishment of a corporatist economic order that would be similar to what Mussolini would achieve in Italy. It was nationalistic and expansionist, calling for the establishment of, or the creation of, Lebensraum, or living space, in the East. The German population was growing. It needed space to expand. This Lebensraum, or living space, was to be acquired in the East, and that would ultimately mean war against either the successor states of Poland and Czechoslovakia, but also possibly against the Soviet Union. The program of the party was also anti-Semitic, arguing that Jews could not be people's comrades, could not ever be real members of this German national community. The point of national socialist social ethics and social vision was to create a classless people's community. It would not be classless in the Marxist sense of the term, but rather it would be based on German ethnicity, race. All Germans would be equal. Until 1923, the NSDAP was little known outside of Bavaria. In fact, hardly known outside of Munich. But 1923, 
this great climactic year of the hyperinflation would change everything and catapult Hitler and his party into the national spotlight. In November of 1923, Hitler led his party in a conspiracy to overthrow the Bavarian government, and then, he hoped, to march on Berlin. In many respects, an echo of Mussolini's march on Rome in the previous year. The Beer Hall Pooch was an absolute fiasco, a disaster from every point of view. Not only had the Nazis and their allies failed to overthrow the Bavarian government, the coup had ended in ignominy. The leaders of the coup arrested, a number of them killed in a confrontation with the Bavarian military authorities. But Hitler would turn his trial for treason in the spring of 1924 into a great public relations victory. While the other members of this conspiracy on trial for treason pleaded not guilty, Hitler took a different tact. Defending himself, he rose in the courtroom in Munich with a national press assembled and gave an oration in which he used his considerable speaking skills to proclaim his commitment to the re-establishment of German honor, German power. If, he said, it is treason to wish to restore Germany to its rightful place in the community of nations, then I am guilty. If wanting to re-establish the German army, so unfairly banned by the Treaty of Versailles, is treason, then I am guilty. If overthrowing the Treaty of Versailles is treasonous, then I am guilty. On and on, in very powerful terms. So impressive, in fact, that the state prosecution suggested at the conclusion of the trial that Hitler be given the minimum sentence for attempting to overthrow the legitimate government of Germany. Hitler would spend several months in 1924 and into 1925 in prison outside of Augsburg in Germany. It was the equivalent of what we would now call a minimum security facility, in which surrounded by potted geraniums and a number of his followers, he would dictate his political autobiography and his political testament. Mein Kampf. My struggle. He laid out there the basis of his political philosophy that was already previewed in the 25 points. In it, he called for the creation of a greater German Reich, the unity of all Germans into one great German state. He railed against the Jews, against capitalists, against Marxists, and stated his determination to use modern political propaganda to create a mass party that would sweep him into power. On his release from prison, he refounded the NSDAP, which had been banned in the aftermath of the Beer Hall Pooch. He announced his intention at that point to pursue the path of legality to power. There would be no more coup d'etats, hatched in beer holes, no more confrontations in an attempt to overthrow the government by force. Instead, Hitler announced the party would henceforth concentrate on recruiting members and on participating in and winning elections. 
not, he emphasized, and he emphasized this quite publicly, not because he'd had a change of heart about democracy, which he saw as corrupt, degenerate, immoral, and a fraud, but rather the Nazis were going to participate in the elections in order to undermine the democracy of the Weimar Republic. In the mid-twenties, during the so-called Golden Twenties, this brief period of stability wedged between the traumas of hyperinflation and the Great Depression, Hitler would concentrate on organizing the party to participate in elections, creating a system of propaganda cells around the country, preparing for the next national election, which would come in 1928. Those elections in the spring of 1928, at the end of four years of relative economic prosperity and political stability, were a disaster for the party, a great disappointment to the NSDAP and its leadership. With less than 3% of the vote, the party was in no danger of making a breakthrough into the mainstream, but was, by everyone's assessment, simply one of a number of extremist parties that showed up from time to time with little ability to make any headway in national politics. The NSDAP, Hitler believed, needed an issue. It needed something that would catapult it into the mainstream of German political life, something that would rescue it from this status on the outer reaches of German politics. That issue was provided by the Great Depression, which, as we've seen, crashed on Germany in the fall of 1929 and into the winter of 1930, and took on absolutely catastrophic proportions. Only the United States would be affected more severely by the Great Depression than Germany. As the Depression deepened in 1929 through 1930, as the government of Germany found it absolutely impossible to slow down the slide of the economy into the abyss, the party began a relentless campaign against what it referred to as the Weimar system and its economic and social failures. The party would master the art of negative campaigning, The party developed a political propaganda apparatus that was remarkably sophisticated for its day. The party would develop the equivalent of survey research. They didn't hand out questionnaires and that sort of thing that one would do at a later date in Western political life, but rather it sent out its operatives. They were supposed to go out into the bars, into the various social clubs into public places, to talk to people, to see what people were upset about, what they were angry about, what sort of issues motivated them. As a consequence, the party in 1929 and into 1930 came increasingly to the conclusion that the best way to sell itself was not to accentuate its ideology of the party, not the 25 points, but rather to cultivate what we now call the art of negative campaigning. Find out what people were unhappy about, what farmers were unhappy about, what white-collar employees were unhappy about, what small shopkeepers were unhappy about, and to take those and craft them into a program that relentlessly assaulted this corrupt Weimar system. In 1929, the NSDAP entered into a temporary alliance with the Conservative Party. 
under Alfred Hugenberg, a press lord in Germany who owned a series of newspapers across the land. Hugenberg, like so many diplomats, statesmen, and political figures afterwards, believed that he could control Hitler, use Hitler for his own purposes. <coughs> As a consequence, the Conservative Party in Germany and the Nazis cooperated in the so-called anti-Young campaign of 1929. Owen Young, once again an American, had come up with, along with a group of international financial experts, a plan that was supposed to settle the reparations issue once and for all. The Young plan came up with a final amount and a schedule of payments for Germany in its reparations obligations. I might add parenthetically that that schedule and the amount, it was a staggering amount, far less, the German government argued, than they had feared, but still a staggering amount in terms of reparations payments. The schedule of payments would have meant that Germans would have been paying reparations well into the 1970s. The conservatives and the Nazis fought against the Young Plan, introduced a referendum against it, and although that referendum failed, this cooperation with conservatives gave Hitler and the NSDAP access to a conservative audience in a way that made the Nazis more respectable. They were cooperating with this respected old German conservative party, and they hoped it would open up the coffers of business interests close to the conservative party. Most important, though, was that it did, in fact, give an air of respectability to Hitler personally because of his cooperation with Hugenberg, and the NSDAP was made more respectable with conservative voters. Meanwhile, the government of Heinrich Brüning continued its stringent policy of economic retrenchment and his use of emergency decrees to pass unpopular economic legislation. The Brüning government was convinced that Germany needed to follow this policy of economic orthodoxy, reduce expenditures, drive down prices, drive down wages, etc. This made Brüning and the Weimar government a very inviting target for the Nazis and their negative campaigning. So unpopular was this package of economic legislation that Brüning had no hope of passing it through the Reichstag, the German parliament, but had to use the special clause, Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution which allowed the Chancellor to use emergency decree powers in times of dire threat to the Republic, to use emergency powers to pass legislation. So Brüning passed this unpopular program of financial and economic retrenchment by emergency decree. The Nazis had a field day. With unemployment mounting, by 1931. Unemployment had absolutely skyrocketed. Businesses were failing on a day-to-day -day basis, and the Nazis entered the fall campaign of 1930, prepared with an expanding membership and a sense of confidence that its campaigning, its electoral campaigning techniques, were now going to lead to a major breakthrough. Everyone anticipated that the radical parties would gain support in the elections of 1930, the first Depression-era elections in Germany. But no one was prepared for the extent of the Nazi breakthrough in September of 1930. The Nazis scored an astonishing electoral triumph, winning 18% of the vote. This doesn't sound like very much, but in Germany, 
with a system of radical proportional representation, which for every 60,000 votes one received, the party got a seat in the Reichstag. 18% of the vote made the NSDAP the second largest political party in Germany. The Nazis, with their radical street organization, the brown shirts, the SA, fighting with the communists in the streets, fighting against the socialists, engaging in all sorts of campaigning activities. The NSDAP was on its way to becoming a major political force in Germany. It certainly was not lingering on the lunatic fringes of German politics. The Nazis, after this electoral breakthrough in September of 1930, would now perfect their campaigning machine, their propaganda machine. They developed a radical new approach to campaigning, a policy of perpetual campaigning. <clears throat> Most German political parties, like American political parties, tended to vanish between elections. The Nazis now decided to continue to campaign as if they were always an election, as if there was always an election underway. <clears throat> During campaigns, they had to compete with other political parties for the attention of the public. But by continuing their campaigns, they would be the main show in town, wherever they tended to focus their attention. So, perpetual campaigning, as the Depression deepened, more people were drawn to the party. More people became members. They became dues-paying members. The party charged admission for their propaganda events, concerts, these German evenings of all sorts of campaigning events. The NSDAP's campaign machine actually became a money-making operation. And attention to technique was the key to Nazi propaganda, not necessarily the content. Over and over again, in the internal propaganda memor uh, memoranda of the party, one sees what works, what color posters look good, what turn of phrase. Should we do Hitler in profile, or should it be a straight-on image of Hitler's face? What sort of slogans work best? How do we approach farmers? How do we make a special appeal to white-collar employees or shopkeepers? The Nazi propaganda <coughs> me, under the very skillful and creative direction of Joseph Goebbels pioneered a variety of modern campaigning techniques that are still with us. Indeed, direct mailing, that great bane of modern life in the late 20th century, was given an enormous boost by the Nazis, who identified voters on the basis of occupation books. They sent farmers special letters dealing with problems of farmers, special letters addressed to workers, all explaining why the NSDAP understood the particular problems of that group. <clears throat> 1932 would be a crucial year of elections in Germany. It would be four national campaigns during this one year. A presidential election in the very early spring, which required a runoff. And then a Reichstag election in the summer. <clears throat> and the second Reichstag election in the fall. In addition, there were regional campaigns state elections in virtually all of the states of Germany, and particularly the two largest, Prussia and Bavaria. So this Nazi technique, this Nazi strategy of perpetual campaigning, 
was ideally suited to this situation. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the bottom had dropped out of the German economy. By 1932, a full third of the German workforce was unemployed. The numbers were staggering. People simply vanished off the unemployment rolls, having gone through all of their benefits. Shanty towns had grown up all around the major cities of Germany. Businesses continued to fail, one right after the other after the other. And the government seemed absolutely incapable of doing anything about it. <clears throat> In the spring, Hitler lost a bid for the presidency to Reich President Hindenburg, the old hero of the First World War. He lost a multi-party bid in the first round of the elections, but forced a runoff with Hindenburg. Although he lost, it put him at least not quite on a par with this most venerated and respected man in German political culture, Hindenburg. But it established Hitler very clearly as the leading opposition figure in the country. Later, in the spring, the Nazis would score major victories in Prussia, Bavaria, and a number of smaller German states, in each case gaining 35, 36, 37, almost 40 percent of the vote. Astonishing in a political system in which there were 30 different political parties. Then in July, the Nazis won 38 percent of the vote in national elections, making the NSDAP for the first time the largest political party in Germany. Hindenburg, however, refused to make Hitler chancellor, and new elections were called for November, when no government without, a Nazi, without Nazi participation could be formed. Hindenburg despised Hitler. He constantly referred to him as that little bohemian corporal. Hitler wasn't from Bohemia, but he had been a corporal in the First World War. Nevertheless, Hindenburg, who detested Hitler for forcing him to run in these elections, in the presidential campaigns, and in the runoff, was not about to make him chancellor if he could avoid it. In the second Reichstag elections, held in November of 1938, the Nazis, for the first time since 1928, when they began their dramatic ascent, the Nazis, for the first time, suffered a defeat, <clears throat> breaking their streak of electoral victories and provoking a crisis in the Nazi leadership. In November of 1932, the party received roughly 32% of the vote. They were still the largest political party, but in secret internal memoranda drawn up by Joseph Goebbels and his propaganda staff, clearly indicated that as far as their own research, in effect survey research, led them to conclude the Nazis had reached the peak of their electoral potential. If new elections occurred, they feared, this very socially diverse constituency, <clears throat> which the Nazis had put together, a constituency that was based not on a commitment to any sort of Nazi ideology, but on a negative assault on the Weimar Republic, this constituency was beginning to unravel. If it came to another election, Goebbels concluded, then the consequences would be catastrophic. <clears throat> Indeed, in December of 1932, in regional elections, the party continued to hemorrhage votes. The NSDAP had indeed reached the outer limits of its popularity 
in anything like free elections. It seemed on the verge of unraveling. The second-in-command of the party deserted Hitler at this point, Gregor Strasser, believing that Hitler had mismanaged the party's leadership. And then, astonishingly, tragically, at the end of January 1933, as a result of an intrigue behind the scenes by conservative politicians, Hindenburg, since no other sort of coalition government seemed at all possible, Hindenburg was convinced to adopt Adolf Hitler, Chancellor of Germany. His cabinet would include only a handful of Nazis, would be dominated by conservatives of one stripe or another. Hitler could be controlled, they believed. And on January the 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler, at a point when his own party and his own political fortunes seemed to be in decline, was appointed Chancellor of the German Republic. It was a political reversal of extraordinary proportions from 1928 to 1933. And the Nazi assumption of power, and it was a bitter and catastrophic irony both for Germany and for Europe, indeed, for the world. <clears throat> the reasons for Nazi success can be summed up in a number of factors. The legacy of the lost war and of Versailles poisoned the political atmosphere in the Weimar Republic, creating the crisis of legitimacy for the Weimar Republic. The chronic economic woes of the Weimar regime also meant that there was no such thing as stability during this brief flirtation with democracy. An inflated period after the First World War, hyperinflation in 1922 through 1923, a successful economic stabilization in the mid-1920s, but it was a <clears throat> very harsh economic stabilization, followed by the Great Depression of 1929 and beyond. It was also the power and inventiveness of Nazi propaganda that clearly played on the failures of the Weimar system. The Nazis realized early on, after 1928, that selling the ideological package that the party stood for was not the way to win votes. That might get them three, four, five, six percent, but would not catapult them into the mainstream. Instead, this policy of negative campaigning and perpetual campaigning would be drawn upon. Finally, there was the inability of the Weimar parties to deal with the economic problems of the period. Alone among the major parties in Germany, the NSDAP had never been in power. It was not sullied, its record not soiled by bad decisions. It was not responsible for the hyperinflation, not responsible for the harsh stabilization of the mid-twenties, not responsible for the Great Depression. It created an ideal situation, an ideal vantage point from which the party could attack the mainstream of German political life. And by 1933, the impossible had happened. Hitler had become Chancellor of the German state. And with that, I will end this particular lecture. And usually at this point, there are videos that I show in class on the Second World War. And again, you can very easily find a huge number of them on YouTube that I will let you uh, find on your own. It shouldn't be terribly difficult. World War II in color, for example. Uh, there are also a number of American propaganda films that were created during the 
Second World War uh, to be shown mainly to soldiers, but later it was uh, shown in public theaters for the American public. Uh, that you can find that or um, while you understand they are propaganda, they nonetheless have an outline of the steps of what takes place during the war that you can find fairly easily out there on YouTube. All right, well, with that, I'll let you go and uh, we'll pick up uh, after the Second World War next time. Thank you.